So what we're going to do now is we're going to take um, hopefully the, the principles and the frameworks that I quickly laid out for you guys in the first talk and go through a couple of examples of how we actually apply these in different places of um, our projects uh, to help you see how we can you know, develop this, this application and characterization. So um, for me, all this stuff is the fun part, right? Because what we're going to talk about is how you gather your data, how you identify the data, how you gather it, where to get it from, and how you synthesize it, right? You know, that's the important part is how you put all the different puzzle pieces together to make a picture, right? That's what I mean by synthesis, right? And so what you want to do is to be able to take everything, not only map data, but subsurface information, geotechnical data, performance data, and you want to put this all together in your conceptual model. Ultimately, you want to be able to build cross sections. If you don't have cross sections in a levy risk assessment, you're doing it wrong. Um, and the main thing is, and this is a little challenging for people who are just doing this for the first time, is you have to understand three-dimensionally. You have to think three-dimensionally in a process-based framework. So that three-dimensionally means laterally, horizontally, and then all around connecting those corners. So uh, this is just a little um, vignette from um, a project I did in California. We did a lot of mapping, right? Mapping is important to delineate the type and the distribution of the materials in the surface and the shallow subsurface that relate to the geomorphology and the depositional environments. And what this was, it's a, it's a synthesis of all this information, historical and recent aerial photographies. There's a 1938 uh, aerial photography that is so useful. Um, there's historic topographic maps that you can get directly from the USGS, and I'll share some of those web links with you in the presentation. Historical soil maps are critical, and we'll talk about those for, for a minute in the, in the presentation. LIDAR is becoming ubiquitous. You have to have LIDAR. You saw in those previous slides how you can uh, see the expression of the geomorphology on the floodplain very clearly. And then, you know, ultimately, in, at the end of the day, we need to marry the geomorphology and the geology and the geotechnical information onto cross sections. That's how you, you know, effectively communicate things uh, amongst the team to demonstrate that you understand the subsurface stratigraphy and how that relates to your backward erosion and piping. So uh, the audience should have these um, in, a, in, a, in a distribution, right? A handout or something, right, uh, Amy or uh, Susie, wherever you are. Do they have these slides in a PowerPoint or something? Yeah, okay. So I'm not going to read these websites to you. You can see it, but, you know, it's very readily available if you just start looking. And, and we have these web links, so you can go find them. Uh, they might be a couple of years old, but... You, know, you can find um, historical aerial photography pretty easily. A lot of colleges now have digital libraries. You know, you can go look at your college, your local university, University of Washington, you know, Illinois uh, State, things like that. They have a lot of these things in their own digital libraries. Um, and those are the historical aerial, aerial photographs are, are critical uh, because they predate a lot of the urbanization. Um, these old historical and recent topographic maps are also very useful. You know, the USGS has an online, you can, it's basically a web-based thing. You can go anywhere in the U.S. and click and find the oldest historical map they have. Um, and then, again, with the local un universities, sometimes they have these, like, old, like, sort of archive um, pictures, right? And this is a picture from a levee failure in Sacramento. So here's a guy standing on top of the levee, and here's a guy down at the bottom of the breach. Right, and so a lot of times, along with that uh, photograph, we'll have some descriptions. Say, okay, over here by, you know, Burns Barn, you know, the levee breached in the middle of the night and you know washed away a couple of houses and stuff like that. And that's really important because if you can find locations where it breached in the past, you know, they probably didn't fix it up real well. They probably just threw down some material and dumped some dirt on top of it. So those can be very easy picks for a, a first cut at a critical location to go. Uh, look for vulner vulnerabilities in your um, in your levee foundation. 
These historical soil maps are, are, are really important. I'll show you a couple of slides from them, uh, and a couple of pictures of them in the next couple of slides, but you know, I, I really like these things. And I was actually just working with my own colleague like three weeks ago, and she was asking me, well, I can't quite figure this out. And I said, well, did you pull the historical topographic map? And she says, no. <laughs> It's like, go get that, and all of a sudden we pull it down and, and you know, things kind of fell into, the puzzle pieces fell into place. So official geologic maps, this is kind of my shtick. I've done a lot of this stuff. I love doing this stuff. It's really cool. You get to look at aerial photos and LIDARs and map things out. Um, so it's, it's um, a, a really powerful tool. And there's actually quite a few of these online. I did a bunch of this stuff in California that's online at that first link. Well. That's, that's a lie. They keep moving that. The Department of Water Resources keeps moving those links around. They actually get harder and harder to find. Um, but that's out there for most of the Sacramento uh, Valley. Um, there's also um, other places that have those um, sort of surficial geologic maps. I think I got a few more links um, coming up later on in a few more slides, but um, I'll show you those. Lighters everywhere, um, you know, it, it can be a little bit of a, of a um, sometimes it's easy, sometimes it's hard sort of scenario where sometimes you get a DEM and you just pull it down and it's awesome. Other times they put up like the raw data and you kind of kind of screw with it, which is less awesome. So again, you know, um, you know, I apologize to whip through that, but since it's in your handouts, I'll let you guys refer back to those. You can check out those web links and things like that. And always, you can just Google historical topographic map, you know, Colorado River, Arizona, and stuff comes up. But, you know, now we're going to move into how do we put these puzzle pieces together, really? I mean, we can talk about the different data sets, but it's about putting these things together in a meaningful way to, to inform our, our risk assessment and our site characterization. So uh, this, again, is an area near Stockton. This is a um, historical aerial photograph on the left. It's 1938 vintage. There's a lot of those across the U.S. because the, the government was mapping farm areas, agricultural areas. And these are pretty key because, as you can see, they predate, you know, the modern-day urbanization. And there's features that you can see on the black and white photo that, um, that are telling about the uh, direct surface geology at the time. I know on the screen it's probably a little hard with this glare, but you know, there's, there's these um, little alluvial fan um, thread channels that are moving from right to left across the landscape, and the levee kind of gets plopped right on top of those things. No record of foundation improvements, and it's likely they never did anything. They probably just constructed right on top of these. These are early uh, 1930s vintage farmer agricultural levees that, you know, today we're spending quite literally a billion dollars to go beef these things up because we got all the consequences behind them. Another example of comparing the historical uh, 1930 vintage aerial photography with the modern day uh, aerial imagery. Um, some of these lines got a little goofed up in the, um, in the slide deck, but essentially this is the Feather River in, Col in California. It's moving uh, from north to south. In the old black and white images, you can, I hate to say you can see, that's kind of not the right word, but the meander scrolls are well expressed in the 1938 black and white imagery. And that's what these little blue lines are supposed to be showing. There's two, um, Meander scrolls, one's inset into the other. Um, so the one blue line is supposed to show the path of, of one and the other. This red line is the modern day levee that was not built at the time. Uh, the levee at the time was like this little thing. Um, and when you look at it today, this is, this is all completely developed out. So if you just looked at the modern topography and the modern aerial images, you would have no idea you have this geomorphology beneath the levee, right? And so uh, this is a part, th these blue lines were supposed to be geo-referenced together. That's why I'm a little irritated that they're offset. But um, what happens is, is this place is called Star Bend. It has a tremendous seepage issue, tremendous seepage issue. And the reason is because they have these coarse grain deposits directly underneath the levee. And you wouldn't know that until you went back and looked at those old photos. So that's why they're a powerful tool 
not just something that we do for fun. You know, it helps you key into why you're having performance problems, where you're having them, and it gives you insight into the probable type and distribution of the materials in the subsurface. So again, in your site characterization, building that model. So I think uh, you were asking about where we can find references for, for old um, river positions. Uh, I find these, um, you can find these in many different places. You know, in, in California and in, in other places like the Mississippi River and the Missouri River, when America was building out to the West, there was a lot of surveys, right? They had like the, you know, the John Wesley Powell survey down the Colorado River, Lewis and Clark up the Missouri River. And these guys would actually survey the floodplain. That was their job. They would, you know, basically their primary chief purpose was navigation. Like what is the depth of the channel? How wide is the channel? But they also kind of took these out onto the floodplain and you can um, find some of these in the Library of Congress. You know, just do, Google it up and uh, other places. We can talk more if you like. Uh, about where to get these data, but you know, if they're there, if you look for it, and, and they do show with pretty good accuracy, because these guys were trained surveyors, you know, what the topography looked like, and therefore what the geomorphology probably was doing at that time. This is an example from um, that place in Iowa that I was talking about, it's near Des Moines. Um, and uh, I, I pulled what they call a plat map. I mean, if you own property, uh, you know what a plat map is. And the reason why the plat map is important is be, because it determined property boundaries that had to be accurate. And so uh, on the slide, I'm showing where um, the old river used to be. That's from the plat map. Yeah, it's in this kind of heavy black outline. Where the river is today, that's in this sort of blue outline. I know it gets a little messy in here. And then where the modern day um, birdland levees are, present day levees. You know, and so just taking this plat map and, and putting it in a GIS, it's pretty easy because it's all mapped out by township and range. You can suck that in pretty easy and get a, and get a pretty accurate geo registration on it. You know, we can see the amount of migration that's occurred of the river towards the modern day levee in just like the last 80, 100 years, something like that. And so it turned out to be pretty dramatic. And when we went out to do our site visit, like the, the river is right up on the levee. And it's interesting because, you know, we were called in to do this, to help Thailand do this risk assessment because they were really worried about underseepers or basically going through a, um, a deficiency correction. But it turned out that actually the risk was riverine erosion. That was where the risk driver was, not under seepage. Um, so these maps help you characterize that. So we're going to take a, a little deeper dive into this sort of whole process of river meandering, because not only does the river meander in one direction, it'll also meander in the other direction. So that is, in places it can be moving towards the levee, in other places on the river it could be moving away from the levee. Right? It's just the typical meandering process. And so, um, oh boy, that didn't turn out super hot. Um, anyway, this is that plat map with those big heavy black lines. Uh, this is before the levee was built. It's just the, the outline of the present day levee is there as sort of a, of a spatial reference frame. So it's not there um, at that time, but that's where the river was in 1894. So now we're going to take another map as from 1914. It's a slightly different type of map, um, but you know you can georeference that in there. And again, the present day levee's not there. Uh, but what we're seeing is that the the river position has actually moved in this sort of southwest direction, away from where today's levee is. And then if you look, this is not there at that time, but that's where the levee's going to go. It's going to go where this little arm of the channel used to be. So you're basically creating space, young alluvium, onto which this levee is going to be constructed. And so when we're going through the risk assessment, we're, we're looking at the subsurface data, we're trying to delineate reaches, and, you know, this particular reach between these two highways was the most confusing thing to understand 
in the subsurface through the geotechnical information that they had. It was, it was confusing. You would have coarse sands and soft clays. You know, they wouldn't line up. There'd be different elevations as you move longitudinally along, uh, along the levee here. And um, we kind of wrestled with it. We made it its own special reach because we couldn't figure it out. And then, you know, because this stuff kind of eats at me when I can't figure it out, that's why I start digging deeper and I start looking harder for maps. And that's when I found the old Platte maps and, you know, that other map that I showed you that's demonstrating that this river is moving laterally away from where we basically now have the levee. So it's a, it's a fundamental change in our subsurface stratigraphy along the levee. And it's completely due to the meandering of the river over the last, you know, 80, 90 years. It's not, not geologic time. This is, this is modern day time. So without kind of going through that analysis, it would be really difficult to understand what the, why those deposits in the subsurface were expressed the way that they were. So again, another example of kind of where uh, levees overlie young river uh, deposits, which are really, really bad for under seepage. Um, this, is, this is Stockton, this is a Stockton deep water ship channel um, here on the modern day uh, aerial photo. And what I've taken is one of these old, old surveys, right? This is up the San Joaquin River, they did up the Sacramento and up the San Joaquin River primarily, primarily for navigability. Um, but these, these, are, these are dynamite maps, they're very accurate. And what it shows is that, you know, the river used to kind of go something like this. You know, it had a typical meandering pattern, right? As I was showing you earlier. And um, what happens, they've, they've channelized it now and they put up these levees. And so we have, I think, five, four or five locations just in this little area where the modern day levee overlies young alluvium or an engineered fill, right? So those are the, the first places that I go looking. Did they have bad performance there? Because that's one of the places that if we're going to have bad performance from under seepage, you're going to see it. And then I also say, well, what's our, you know, subsurface information like? Can we characterize those materials? Um, what ends up happening more often than not is you get one boring there, and you get one boring there, one boring there. So. You know, the dearth of data is really the most limiting factor in terms of trying to put together the model for some of these systems because, you know, borings are a thousand feet apart or whatever. And that's when you have to lean on your, your geomorphology to kind of help you paint the picture of, of why you think you're seeing what you're seeing or what you might anticipate uh, beneath those levee segments. Uh, so again, the, these are the historical soil survey maps I was telling you about. You know, I, I kind of like these. Don't don't look at this stuff on the right. Don't look at the text. Um, you know, the, the main thing is is that the old soil mappers in the late 1800s and early 1900s were essentially geomorphologists. They understood the relationship between river deposits, terraces, and the expression of um, young alluvium, inset into older alluvium, you know, young recent flood deposits. Um, so this is, this is if, you, if you notice, this is that same birdland levee again, right here. You know, this is where we have that erosion problem. This is where the channels moved away from the levee. And this is where we have those meander scrolls, right? Those, those two foot contours and the DEM, the yellow and blue DEM. And these guys, the old soil survey dudes, they basically picked out that meander scroll and mapped it as something different, right? And the text explains what they mapped it as. Basically, fine grain, sugar, sand, loose, wet. Okay, like the absolute worst stuff you could have for under sea pitch. Um, so just even these kind of like cartoony sort of looking um, historical soil maps are, are really useful towards understanding your, your shallow stratigraphy and your potential for BEP. Uh, so this is this is another soil survey map. This is from St. Louis. This is not far from the um, slide that I showed you trying to illustrate the uh, inset relationship, the erosional relationship uh, concept. Um, and you know it doesn't. The levee comes along here along the Mississippi River, right? And one the one thing that you can take away from this is you can just look at the patterns on the map and. It just doesn't take much to be like, yep, there's some abandoned channels and meander scrolls on the floodplain back here. You know, and if, if the levee's right here, it's gonna cross cut or overlie all of those deposits, right? So, I mean, 
and even a dumb old dirt guy like me can take a look at this map and just be like, okay, I can start putting these puzzle pieces together using what I understand about how you know rivers express themselves on floodplains and what that means for the likely subsurface architecture and how that relates to your failure mode. Uh, I'm not going to talk about the, the the colors on the slide as much because this is kind of a complicated one. But you know the main take home point is that um, the Corps of Engineers has a whole bunch of these. Um, surficial geologic maps uh, available online. Uh, I think this is all through ERDIC because um, this is work that was done, you know, from the 50s, you know, all the way up today, including Fisk and um, guys like that who really did a great job mapping all these meander belts out. Um, but the point is, is you can find these maps. You don't have to bake them yourself. You can go find these and then, you, you know, overlay your levees along it and it'll give you a really good first cut understanding of the geomorphology on the floodplain and what's underneath uh, your levee. So again, this is um, back to our LIDAR thing. Um, sometimes if you don't have uh, your own maps that you can download from somewhere, you know, you can take first cut at mapping them, you know, especially geologists, you're geologists, you should be doing this if you don't have these maps available, it's not really that hard. Um, but this is basically the slide I had earlier um, showing the inset relationships just turn 90 degrees. So this would be your older terrace material higher up here, your younger floodplain material. I mean, you can see how basically the older material gets truncated and eroded. I mean, that's just classic, classic um, inset relationship right there. And, you know, you can see these meander scrolls like very well expressed on this floodplain to topography. You know, it's, it's, it's pretty obvious. You know, the river's over here, here's our levee. And, you know, when we start putting things like performance data, you know, where have we had seepage and sand boils, right? It's these, these triangles. And it basically directly overlies these meander scrolls, right? So it helps you understand why you may not have a whole bunch of performance issues over here in one spot and why it's kind of concentrated over here in another spot. This is the whole thing about synthesizing your data, putting stuff together in time and in space to help you characterize your subsurface stratigraphy to build a site model. And then ultimately what we do, you know, we need to come up with cross sections. When you come into a risk assessment, you have to have cross sections. Uh, this is actually more of a, a, of a profile of um, a system that is in Natomas, California. And it's quite simply, I'm just saying, you know, you have to put all this data together. The first thing you have to do is here's the top of the levee, here's the bottom of the levee, and it overlies these basically nested channels, right? And there's a whole story behind those nested channels, and, and you know, it's fun to talk about. But then you put your CPT data on there, or you put your geotechnical stick log data on there, and then you're trying to, you know, paint the picture that relates your geomorphology, your geology, and your geotechnical information into one model that makes sense and is defendable. You know, that's how you can stand up in the review boards and say, I understand what's going on and I understand why we're having the problems where we're having them. And this is why we think we characterize the risk accurately. Um, so you have to have, you know, a way to demonstrate your information on paper, not only because it helps you build the case, but it helps you communicate amongst your teammates, right? Because if you can't see it, you can't believe it. Uh, this is a this is another one. Do I have a couple of minutes, um, Dara? How are we doing on time? Okay. <laughs> I just get all excited. I love this stuff. Um, so we'll take a second. And we'll talk about this one again. This is we're going we're going back to we're going back to Iowa. This is this is the Birdland Levee, right? So. We're going to be talking about this really special case that was between these two highways where the river was in one position before they built the levee and moved away. There's some other younger material that comes in behind it and then they build the levee on top of that, right? So we're trying to develop um, a, a cross section here for basically a seepage analysis. We're trying to, as you go along these levees, you know, um, you have to look at many different locations. Um, for uh, the for the failure mode of backward erosion and piping, because it's not always going to be at one place, and that's why levy risk assessments can get a little uh, tangled up because it's it's pretty um, thorough. 
Um, but what we were doing is, is we were building a cross section uh, through this area to try and start characterizing the nodes in the event tree, okay? So do we have fine young sands? Do we have continuity of materials? Those are the two basic um, first parts of your nodes for your BEP for levees. So um, the top here is, is the cross section that we were working on. So we had some CAD guy, you know, he basically rips this section. Rivers over here, floodplain over here, and your levees up here. And so we had the wonderful task. We had, we had, we had a couple of, of old borings that went through the original sort of like farmer's levee. This is sort of the original farmer's levee here. This is a little attempt at a cutoff key. And we had a couple of stick logs and they're saying, we got all these thick sands, right? Again, it's what I was saying earlier. It's a thick, fine, uniform, wet sand, right? It's your classic, like we've got a, we've got a problem for backward erosion and piping here. But then when we look at the information at the toe, which um, it wasn't really like conventional borings. They weren't doing like samples and SBTs. I don't know what these guys were doing out there, but I remember their data was really, um, I don't want to say questionable, but it carried a lot of uncertainty with it, right? And so the materials in these subsurface um, explorations back here were showing a lot of finer grain material, this sort of gray stuff, silts and clays up here, and then just kind of thin little beds of sand, right? So we go from where we have thick sand underneath the levee and the river's out here again, to where we have these kind of interbedded sands and clays, right? So as the team, we're sitting there and we're trying to figure out like, are, are these really continuous or not? And so they look at me and they go, Justin, what's the geomorphology say? And so that's when I started putting together those maps and trying to like un, untangle the puzzle, sort of back engineer it, figure it out. And that's when we started to, you know, find that um, situation where the levee, where the river used to be here, and it migrated over to here, right? So there's two things that come along with that. Number one is, is this erosional relationship, right? So you'd have floodplain here, river here, and then the river migrates that way, right? So there's an erosional contact in here between the material over here and then the river material that replaced it as the, as the river migrated away from the present day levee. You know, so we were able, I was able to kind of take that information i'm showing these guys the maps and the gis we're kind of you know working meeting just rolling it up no powerpoints just just talking about it you know we're trying to figure out what the deal is in our big data gap right here so i came up with this conceptual model that basically said hey guys you know the river actually has been moving this way through time we can demonstrate through this map time series analysis that what was under that the deposits that the levee now sits on are different than the ones out here because of the river moving that way. So I kind of came up with this sort of um, little hokey thing. I said, well, you know, in my sort of geo fantasy world, conceptual world, that's probably where I would put the boundary of the old channel that we saw on the map several slides ago, that one. This little abandoned arm of the channel right here that the levee directly sits on is basically a bounding geometry for what's underneath the levee that's different. It's an erosional unconformity to the material that's back here. Now, you know, that carries some uncertainty with it. You know, you can realize there's, there's a lot of coarseness in, in this map. You know, you have to you have to always be cautious with map scales. You know, I'm kind of over zooming in on this guy a little bit, um, but I kind of didn't have much choice. So I'm trying to put the, you know, very sketchy puzzle pieces together to come up with a model. And so that's where we ended up is, you know, I said, okay, I, you know, based on the geomorphology and what I've seen in these data and putting these things together, I do not think that there is continuity between these thick sands and these little sands, that there's some erosion along conformity in there. So we ended up giving the likelihood of continuity low, point one. So that's how you put all this data together. That's how you look at it in a geomorphic framework. 
to develop a site characterization that leads you to a model that informs how you elicit nodes in the event tree. So it's, um, you know, fun stuff for me. I love doing this stuff. Um, and, you know, I think it's critical because as we talked about in, in the morning, you know, hour ago or whatever, 25,000 miles of levees. They're, almost all of them are on floodplains next to rivers, right? So, like I said, I don't expect the geotechnical engineers to really master every single thing, but it's enough to give you a working framework so when you're in a risk assessment, you can poke your geologist and be like, what's going on with geomorphology here? Gives you enough information to say, hey, you know what? Maybe I'm interested in this as an as a engineer, and I want to go pull down these maps, and I want to take a look at this. So hopefully, you know, by the end of the day, you not only have come away with some new knowledge of geology, geomorphology, and processes and why processes are important, but also come away with new tools for helping you evaluate your levees, your geology, and your geomorphology, and how it all comes together in site characterization space to have a model uh, to inform your risk assessment. So uh, I think we're gonna stop there. Um, certainly, um, I'm totally happy to take questions. And you know, if anybody wants to talk offline during the break or anything like that, uh, I'm happy to do so. And um, what I always do at the end of these, these kind of workshops is I, I make myself available, right? So um, I'm Justin Pierce, I'm with the Corps of Engineers. You can find my email. If you have questions as you're working on projects, either tomorrow, next week, next month, or next year, you know, you can email me, I am happy to help, you know, because nothing makes me happier than when people actually try and do the things that I think they should be doing. So feel free to reach out to me as part of my job. All right, thanks everybody. Yeah. So um, yesterday we were looking at that top two projects and Josh, do I need this really? Uh, so uh, Josh, correct, and, and so if I get this wrong, correct me, but he, I think he correctly uh, observed uh, and noted that on our Denison cross sections, there's a big difference between the three sections that we had, right? So as you're going up the abutment, there's a change in, in the soils and, and how those things are laid down. And so he was like, well, cutting a, a straight cross section upstream downstream doesn't make exact sense. It might be doing something different where we have to, you know, and, and you were getting at the fact that, like it's, it's not a, a, a straight line. So we might have to think in 3D. And so I guess my question is, um, do you have like some advice on a better way to portray that? And because we cut 2D sections, right? Slices all the time to show people what's going on and it's, and it's intuitive to look at, but sometimes it might not be the best way to uh, accurately represent what's going on. And so do you have any advice for that? And, and first, did I get that kind of close to right, Josh, or do you have anything to add? Same with me. Well, you were the one that brought it up, so. Yeah. Close enough? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, no, that's good. I think, you know, um, mul multiple sections and multiple directions are the first step, right? You know, I think there's a lot of, you know, because we have a lot of digital tools, a lot of folks want to go directly to a three-dimensional sort of thing, right? Take, let's just take, you know, our borehole points and throw them into a, program and contour things, and that's gonna be our three-dimensional model. And I don't think that that's the appropriate first step in many cases, because it's, it's uninformed, right? So what I mean by that is like, you can have these erosional relationships where, where um, things change laterally over a short distance of, of space, right? So you need to develop multiple 2D cross sections to make sure you have an understanding conceptually of what things should look like. And then you, if you want to, you can take that into a 3D model and do some subsurface contouring and things like that to develop, you know, all, you know your surface in 3D. Um, but if you don't have that good understanding from doing multiple cross sections in two dimensions, like I love doing box diagrams, right? You know, fence diagrams, box diagrams, it's kind of old school, but it forces, it forces you 
to maintain interpretation, right? So if you have four corner points of subsurface borings, right? And, you, and you're basically making a cross section this way and a cross section this way and a cross section this way and a cross section this way. Well, you know, guess what? Like what you interpret on this cross section at this point has to be exactly the same as what you interpret on this cross section at that same point. I have literally seen it like this was like six weeks ago, I was doing an ATR review and they had, they had this little sort of box diagram thing. They're trying to do what I'm talking about, but the uh, interpretation, if, if here's your borehole, here's one section going like this, the interpretation here going to this borehole was different than the interpretation here going to the same one. I was like, it doesn't make sense at all, you know? So doing kind of that just like rudimentary, like, you know, a couple of cross section forces you to have cons internal consistency in your interpretation. And, you know, the counterpoint is that, well, it's all internally wrong. <laughs> but, you know, it's like, well, you know, go make a better model if you don't like what I've got, you know, but at least it's consistent all the way around. And, you know, hopefully that way you can ensure that it's reasonable with geomorphic and geologic principles. And once you get that confidence that you've got that pretty well constrained, then, you know, then I'm like, okay, if you want to make three-dimensional maps and surfaces based on that sort of model, conceptual model, then yeah, that's perfect. Does that make sense? Yeah. No. No, no it's, it's internally wrong. <laughs> Sounds good. Yeah. And I have a question. I'm seeing a lot of, I guess, surface data and boring data. Are there any, uh, Geophysical methods that you use to try to look at cotton dairy flower Yeah. Yeah, that's that's a great question. Um, I spent like three, four, five years of my life working for the California Department of Water Resources when we were evaluating 300 miles of urban levees and 800 miles of non urban levees, right? It's 1,000 miles of levees. So they hired a company that took a um, basically helicopter electromagnetic survey over the levee to, you know, get a, a, a long distance, continuous picture of the subsurface environment. Um, and it, it can be useful. Um, the, the chief, there were two chief limitations with the, ge with the geophysical survey is number one, it picked up electrical signals like nobody's business or power lines went across the levees and across the rivers, it would light everything up. And that was kind of a, a, of a problem. And the second thing is, 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 you know, it basically wasn't calibrated, right? So it's just kind of, you know, doing its, its thing, thinking, all right, well, you know, here's high resistivity, here's low resistivity. This is how you translate that into, you know, this is clay, this is sand. But areas of like subsurface groundwater would throw that off, right? Because the water adds some resistivity or, or um, conductivity to the soil. So that would kind of throw that off a little bit. But there is value in doing that um, because it will help you put information between the borings, right? If one, if they're a thousand feet apart and you don't know what's in between, you know, the geophysics can really help you do that. Um, you wanna, if you're gonna do geophysics, you wanna make sure it's developed the right way, right? So if you're doing ground-based stuff, you know, you really want to do it kind of at the toe, you know, if you're worried about under seepage, right? Because like the prism, the levy prism is commonly fine grained, right? And it tends to eat up a lot of that geophysical energy and things don't really penetrate down there quite right. So you want to design the geophysical survey according to the needs of your study. And then the core has done some of that. There's some publications where the, the um, I can't remember the guy's name, but uh, Jamie, you might know, um, who was doing that. But anyway, uh, the Corps has done that in, in the recent past, as well as a research project to demonstrate the utility of geophysics for evaluating levy uh, foundation stratigraphy for backward erosion piping. All right. Thanks, everybody.